Johann. Johann was born in rural Germany in the early 1900s. His father was a farmer, and his mother was a homemaker. From a very young age, Johann participated actively in his family's farm. He particularly liked animals, so much so that he refused to hunt them. Johann refused to hunt animals because he did not want to harm them. In 1933, Adolf Hitler rose to power in Germany. Soon after, Johann joined the Nazi regime. A couple of years into the Second World War, Johann's brother was killed by the Allied forces. Following the death of his brother, Johann participated much more actively in the war, believing more ardently in its ideals. He was part of the Nazi invasion of France. He was part of Operation Barbarossa. And he even marched on Russia. So how did this man, Johann, go from not wanting to hunt animals because he didn't want to harm them, to participating actively in the Nazi regime. I've spent the last almost decade of my life studying, interviewing people, serving people, and really trying to quantify the factors that influence people's behavior for good or for bad. I've seen good people, fathers, mothers, sometimes my own family members, sit at the dinner table and justify everything from small-scale wrongdoings to large-scale atrocities. When I was 16 years old, I sat across the table over dinner from a very close family member of mine, who was a military official at the time, and asked him, what was it like, as you are defending our country, to know that on some level, you may be harming some people? And his response to this was, the military does not harm people. It's always self-defense. I found this statement incredibly fascinating. Psychologists call it moral disengagement, strategies that we as humans use to justify our behavior on an individual and on a group level. On an individual level, we do this to reduce what we call cognitive dissonance, basically so that we are able to live with ourselves so that our brains are not completely confused by the fact that, wait, I know that what I'm about to do is wrong. I've, I've been socialized to think about it as wrong, but I'm doing it, so, and I need to live with myself. I can't live with myself knowing that I'm a bad person, so I need to justify this. Very importantly, we also need to justify our behavior on a group level. Our behavior needs to line up with our group ideologies. Humans are social animals, and we know that aligning ourselves with certain groups makes our chances of survival a lot better. The very important link, the key link to draw here, is that our group norms, our group ideologies, strongly influence our individual behaviors and attitudes and ideologies. To contextualize this within the Sri Lankan context, we conducted a study in 2012 where we interviewed and surveyed both Sinhalese and Tamils from across the island, people from different walks of life, homemakers, um, military officials, political officers, businessmen and women. And we found that 74% of both Sinhalese and Tamils justified their behavior and disengaged from certain behaviors that they or their group, or their group committed against the other group. Some of these justifications included using whitewashing language. We need to sacrifice the few for the many. One that has been used throughout the ages, and interestingly enough, was the one that was the strategy that was used the most within our sample, was displacement of responsibility. My commanding officer told me to do it. Someone else told me to do it, so I did it. 
It can include outright denial or discrediting of evidence. No, I cannot accept that my group did that. Or maybe they did do that, but not the way that you're saying that it did. No, that did not happen. I cannot accept that. One that I find particularly interesting is essentialist attribution. And this is the notion that you did something wrong because of some inherent, innate characteristic that you are born with. It is in your blood. You are stubborn, you did not give in, so we had to go in there and commit some level of violence against you. This is related to a robust literature in psychology, where we find that whenever you do something wrong, I tend to make very internal attributions. Say things like, you're, you didn't do that right because you're not intelligent enough. It's in your blood, you're too stubborn, so we had to do this. But if I do something wrong, I usually make very external attributions. Things like, I didn't have time to think this through. My commanding officer told me to do it. Someone else told me to do it. Or, I shot at you because you shot at me. Self-defense. This research was conducted in 2012. If we look at 2018, preliminary research that we conducted following the communal violence in Digana, Sri Lanka, shows the exact same strategies. We need to fight violence with violence. It's only self-defense. The key thing to understand here is that we all do it. There's no point in pointing fingers at other people, because we have been justifying, humans have been justifying and disengaging from our behaviors from across the ages, globally. If we look at Johann, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime were very skilled at engineering the norms in Germany so that it made it very easy for people like Johann to justify any and all atrocities that they committed against a variety of different minorities. You, the Jews, are stealing our jobs. You, the Jews, are ruining our economy. You, the Jews, are stealing our culture, ruining our culture. So it made it very easy for people like Johan to go in and say, well, I'm just defending our group, right? Setting the default to conscription so that everyone from a very young age had to participate in the war normalized it even further so that everyone could say, well, everyone else is doing it, so I guess it must be normal, so I guess I have to do it. My group is doing it. Adolf Hitler even had a ministry of propaganda dedicated to influencing group norms. We are all a product of our group norms. But what if our group norms could be influenced for good. Take an average day, a typical day in your life. We receive our information from a variety of different sources. These sources can include people, people whom we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis or irregularly, religious leaders, political leaders, our parents, friends, colleagues, bosses. We could receive this information from actual signs, signs which say, don't drink and drive, say no to sexual harassment and domestic abuse. These, this information can be delivered via face-to-face -face interactions, but also virtually, via WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram. The key thing to identify here is that certain people are much more effective at influencing our behavior over others. To take an example of this, research that was conducted to identify how we can reduce the incidence of bullying found that within, in, within school children, found that the most effective influences of school children's behavior was not the Kumar Sangakkaras or the Kanye Wests or the Taylor Swifts of their time, regardless of their celebrity status. No, it was actually other school kids that the rest of their peers interacted with. Think about it. Popular kids in classrooms dictate to their peers what to wear, where to go, how to speak, what's cool. And these researchers found that working with these 
identified popular kids who had influence over the rest of their peers, getting them to speak out against bullying, and actually wear physical markers, which say that, like bracelets, which say that they were against bullying. Across 56 schools and over 24,000 students, this experiment reduced the incidence of bullying by 30% in just one year. The power of social norms to influence behaviors for good has also been found within the context of intergroup conflict. Rwanda is now a post-war society. But in 1990, just 18 years ago, the Rwandan Civil War began. The Rwandan Civil War culminated in the Rwandan Genocide, where within the space of just three months, close to one million people, estimates suggest that close to one million people were killed. The Rwandan Civil War was waged between the two major warring groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis. Ten years after the Rwandan Civil War ended, an experiment was conducted in a small community in Rwanda where a radio drama was aired. This radio drama told the story of a community, something that the Rwandan, that the Hutus and the Tutsis could actually identify with. Two groups that were in conflict, who had social tensions. And they crafted characters whom the listeners could actually properly identify with. But very importantly, this radio drama, crafting these characters, also showed these characters coming across community lines. They showed these characters having intermarriages between the two groups. And they had these characters speak out against leaders who promote violence. And as a result of this experiment, researchers found that I, as a Hutu, may not even like you as a Tutsi on a personal level, but if I'm made to believe that my group supports intermarriages between Hutus and Tutsis, that my group supports individuals who speak out against leaders who promote violence, then I am much more likely to do the same regardless of my own personal beliefs. This is a powerful indication of how our group norms can strongly in influence our individual behaviors and even override them. This experiment also tells us the important distinction between storytelling and factual messaging. Factual messaging is just throwing positive information about a group that you may not like at you. Throwing memes that, about a group, positive memes about a group that you may not like at you. Humans tend to internalize information that supports our already pre-held, pre-existing worldviews and reject information that challenges it. But storytelling is a powerful way with which we can circumvent this problem, because we can craft characters that the listeners can identify with so that they can actually start to think, well, if this character is doing it, does my group actually support this? If my character is doing this, then maybe I can do it too. And if we look at Johan, Following the end of the Second World War, the social norms in Germany completely shifted. Radio messaging, in this case, went from xenophobia to we need to rebuild Germany together. Schools started teaching their students exactly what happened during the Second World War, about the wrongdoings that had been committed, so that their students understood exactly why it must never happen again. The norm went from blind patriotism to being critical, being critical of the information that they received on a day-to-day -day -day basis, on newspapers and, and um, Instagram, etc. Instagram is now, back then it was newspapers, I think, and TV and radio. <laughs> we have at our disposal powerful tools which we can use to influence our group norms for good. 96% of people 
in Sri Lanka who have regular access to the internet are on Facebook. These tools can include Facebook, but it can also include WhatsApp, Instagram, newspapers, radio, the TV. We need to question the information that we receive via these tools. Is that WhatsApp message that you just received being used to influence our group norms for good or for bad? And we ourselves can use these tools to influence our group norms for good. And if you're still in doubt as to the power of social norms, and if social norms can actually be influenced for good, let's look at Johan. Johan, who participated actively in the Nazi regime. Johan, who lost his brother during the Second World War. Johan, who used to sign his letters with Heil Hitler. Johan also happens to be my grandfather in law. <laughs> Johan had a family and a grandson who embraced me with open arms into their lives. As a social psychologist, I can tell you with conviction, we are not born to hate. We learn to hate. And in the same way, we can learn to accept. We can learn to empathize. We can learn to accept our fellow human beings, regardless of the different groups that they choose to identify with. We can learn to use the tools at our disposal to influence our group norms for good and move forward and rebuild our country together. Thank you for listening. <laughs>